Welcome to Education in Our Community. This show is about lifelong learning, teaching, and mentoring. We have a very special guest today. Uh, I'm working with Reverend Robert McKnight, who is the host for the shows that we have with Education in Our Community. And our special guest today is Mr. Roy Clay. Mr. Clay has an ex extensive background where he was the uh, city council person and also the vice mayor of the city of Palo Alto, California. And I understand you live in Oakland at the present time. Thank you for coming to Oakland. Oakland is a stranger's paradise. I had heard another line that says, Oakland is a place to lose the blues. <laughs> that, that's a show, a television show that's been going now for 22 years. And it really celebrates the positive movers and shakers and image makers. And what I have heard about you and looked on the internet and discovered about you, that you have been making things happen from the very beginning as it relates to technology. Reverend McKnight uh, and I have the privilege of working with you today to let people know of the history makers that are here in the Bay Area. We just recently did a show called, what was it called about African Americans, uh, Mr. Reverend McKnight? African American first. First. Those who were first in various fields and science, our pioneers um, in medicine, education, politics. So Mr. Clay, were you a pioneer? I think, in a way, not the first in many things, but I was early to enter uh, several uh, areas. Some, some of us first, and some I followed others. Uh, I uh, always followed what my mother told me, and that was to learn how to do something well so that when I entered uh, kindergarten, for whatever reason, I knew I was going to go to college. So I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and then my mother uh, would have me uh, visit my older sister's uh, uh, college in Jefferson City, Missouri, once a year, just to get accustomed to that, that life. life. And, uh, and surely, I just follow whatever she thought I should do. And she, she didn't tell me precisely the things that I had to do, but just do as, as well as you can. And uh, I remember uh, an incident where I uh, was stopped by the police in the, because of an, in, in an area that black folks didn't normally visit. During, and I was asked why I was there, and I was there because I was working. I was doing gardening work because that's how, that's how I made money and then, yes. and when I was a teenager. And I was, I was ordered into the policeman's car, and uh, he drove me. I didn't know where he was going, where he was taking me. Yes. But he took me back to the uh, uh, town where I was reared, asked me out of the car. And uh, I got out, and he said to me, don't ever let me catch you here again. Mm. And I walked away uh, really angry, um, but also somewhat fearful because I didn't know what, we would, what the policeman would do. And uh, in fact, I could have been another Trevor Martin. Yes. And I told my mother what had just happened. And she said to me, uh, you're going to encounter racism, racism for the rest of your life. But don't, don't ever let that be reason why you don't succeed. Right? Do, do as well as you can do at what you do, and that will cause you to be successful. You were uh, working in the garden? Uh, you were an, on a job? I'm on a job. I was a gardener. Gardener? And, yeah. And at a home? At a home, yes. And did they tell you that you weren't supposed to be there? No. They did not. No, no. I I was leave, uh, leaving one of my uh, gardening jobs. It was a hot summer day, and I stopped to buy a coke. I had enough money to buy yes. a, a soft drink. Yes. And while I was drinking the, the soft drink, the policeman came by, 
and saw me sitting on the curb oh. and asked me to get in the car. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yeah. So he didn't see you working in the garden? No. Is that right? He, he just uh, assumed that I was in the wrong place. Yeah, and you were mm -hmm. drinking a soda pop or yes, something. That's correct. Yeah. Reverend McKnight, uh, this is amazing to hear because you, you would think that if he was working that this would not have happened, yeah. but you were sitting down. Yes. Isn't that something? Yes. Mm -hmm. This has happened all over the country. Yes. Um, yeah. Even here in Berkeley, I experienced that. Really? Uh, while I was working with my stepfather leaving mm -hmm. uh, the Berkeley Hills. Yeah. With your father? Uh -huh. Yes. And so they had to verify where he was coming from before they would allow him to leave. Where he yeah. was coming from. And you were with him? I was with him uh -huh. in the car with him. In the him. car, I see. And so uh, they had to follow him back to the home. And wow. so they had to substantiate the fact that he had been working in the yard yeah. for them. And so that, that was all over uh, the country. Mr. Clay, then, with that as an uh, opening uh, to your uh, experiences, and then your mother and her, your, her at indicating that you should not let that keep you from being the very best that you could be, did you find that you had to go over that again in your life, uh, just mm. repeatedly, or was that over? Well, no, it continues. It continues? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it does? Yeah, uh, and that is, I learned that wherever I went, uh, I had to be as good as I could be. In fact, I was uh, taught to believe that I had to be better to be considered equal. Yes, mm. yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I went to uh, my first college integrated experience was at St. Louis University. And uh, I, I thought I could be as good as anybody at anything. Yes. Mm. Fortunately, I was, uh, that was instilled in me mm -hmm. as a child. Mm -hmm. But when I arrived at St. Louis University, they wondered how I got there. Yes. Mm. Uh, many people didn't think I was educable. Oh, really? Uh, but I worked through to get a uh, mm -hmm. degree in mathematics mm -hmm. and on my first job. And when I wanted to work in the private sector, uh, I went to location, McDonnell Aircraft, it's McDonnell Douglas now. Yeah. And uh, I, I sent my resume and it showed that I was from St. Louis University. Uh, they assumed that I was white. Yes. But when I arrived uh, at McDonnell, they said to me, Mrs. Craig, we're very sorry. We have no jobs for yeah. professional Negroes. Professional Negroes. We have no jobs. Mm -hmm. Whatever professional Negro is, <laughs> yes. we have no jobs for them. Uh -huh. And I walked away very, very disappointed, as you might expect. Yes, yes. Um, but I taught school after that. And I was lucky because in the area where I taught school, that's where I met my wife. Yes. I would not have if I had been hired by McDonald to begin with. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, I did go back to McDonald. I was referred by a young man who was a brother of a member of the Harlem Globetrotters, yes. Sam Wheeler's brother, mm -hmm. uh, uh, enticed me to go back to McDonald because they had, they had openings and they, they hired me. And that's where I learned uh, computers. You learned computers at McDonald's? At McDonald, mm -hmm. right. So there was no computer science discipline. Right? What year was that? That in was in 1956. 56. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, 1956, January 56, uh, and uh, let's see, uh, Bill Gates yes. was born October 1955. 1955. <laughs> so he was three months old. Three months old, <laughs> Bill Gates. When I got it. And yeah. Steve Jobs wasn't around either. He wasn't no. he born yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mr. Crater, this actually makes you a first in the field above and beyond race. Most people knew nothing of computer programming correct. in the 1950s. That's correct. And the reason is that computers in the 50s were used by uh, various industries and they were a computer 
that would have the capability to get, get your desk computer now would be the size of this room uh, oh, yes. with air conditioning. Yes. On. So, and you couldn't buy an IBM computer. They rented that computers. And it's the um, way that computers came into the uh, domain of households was in the late 60s uh, when at Intel Corporation, mm -hmm. a young, young man uh, developed of the microprocessors that caused computers mm -hmm. to be miniaturized so so that what was that time the space requirement of this room mm -hmm. and uh, with with special uh environmental condition mm -hmm. can now be done in your my coat pocket <laughs> yes <laughs> yes and that young man that name was um robert noyce no n o n o y c e and I was asked to meet him because of what he had done. And I worked with uh, Robert Norris for six months or better, determining what we can best do, what he had just developed. And we said we could um, automate traffic lights, uh, elevators, elevators then were operated by individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, appliances, and uh, we looked at doing all these things, but then I, I recommended that rather than building any one of these, pro these uh, products, just sell the component, sell it to the people who built elevators. Mm -hmm. And uh, that came about um, so smoothly, going from the elevator operated by the human being to now all uh, elevators electronically operated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, traffic lights are controlled by electronics. Uh, and uh, we looked at the various things that, that could be done. We never considered what might be done in, in space. We never thought about going into space because just the computer needed to operate yeah. uh, in, in space. The, the size and the weight could not be sustained. Yes. Uh, as well, at, at that time, a computer uh, that uh, you would need to operate something in space really couldn't be done because uh, the, com the computer uptime, that is, a computer at the time could be operated safely and 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 with uh, accuracy, with about maybe six to eight hours. Mm. Right. Six to eight hours. So, so nothing could be done. We never thought about going to space, yes. but it could not have been done mm -hmm. had it not been for the uh, design of the uh, microprocessor. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I um, was hired by uh, Hewlett Packard. Hewlett company. Packard. Yeah. And, the, and it's just the, the strangest way. Hey, excuse me. When was this you were hired by Hewlett Packard? In 1965. All right. Okay. And uh, that was to develop a computer that would enable the Hewlett Packard instrumentation to access data, acquire data, and to send it back so that you could operate uh, an AKG machine or anything that could be uh, used to acquire data from an individual, that could be brought back to the computer and, uh, and form what I call a closed loop, closed loop system. Now, um, many things happen after that, but um, I was uh, interviewed by, invited by HP for an interview. And I went to the interview and decided I, don't, I didn't want the job. And they made an offer to me and uh, I declined. I declined because I didn't think they knew what they were doing. Oh, <laughs> I see, okay. 
And uh, they invited me back for another interview. Mm -hmm. But this time, David Packard was there. Really? To explain to me why he wanted to develop a computer. Okay. And why he chose to uh, develop it himself rather than to acquire a company to do it. And, and uh, I was uh, really impressed that the company was very successful at was doing something. That even though they were not building computers, that they were successful at, so successful at what they did that whatever they built, somebody would look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, I knew that they would be uh, 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 d developed with uh, enough uh, cash to survive yes. no matter what we did. Mm -hmm. And I chose to go to HP. That was in 19... In 1965. 65. Yeah. Now, mind you, um, David Packard knew what he wanted in the end, but they didn't know how to get there. Yes. <laughs> and uh, then I say, I've said many times, if they knew, if they knew what would be required to get there, they probably would not have hired me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because, uh, whereas, uh, I decided not to go to begin with because I didn't think it knew, they knew enough about what they were trying to do. And I thought about being in any place alone where if I had, if I needed help uh, to gain um, uh, support for a product that I wanted to develop, who would I have to talk with? Mm -hmm. There was nobody. Nobody. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Fortunately, David Packard had enough confidence in me to permit me to do anything I wanted to do. Okay. Then he never asked why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. I told them what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my wife knows, my late wife, we know, that I would walk 13 hours a day because I knew, I wanted, I knew what I needed to have done. And I did, to acquire the resources to do it and people uh, I need it, and I recall uh, I would do interviewing, uh, designing, determining what we needed to do, uh, and just bring the people in. And in fact, one thing I'm very proud of is that I started a uh, college interviewing system for black colleges that Hewlett Packard had never done. Um, and and uh, I hired people. Uh, I know from Morehouse College. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, 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 an environment which I was very much uh, supportive of and happy that we could do it. That I could bring someone from uh, uh, a black college into Palo Alto uh, with an undergraduate degree, send them to Stanford, Uni Stanford University, mm -hmm and pay for, their, uh, pay for their education while they were going through. Now, that also works extremely well for me, aside from just bringing people in who could do things. Mm -hmm. I was able to hire a young man whom I had met at Hewlett Packard Company, who I was support, able to support through Stanford to uh, get a, a PhD in, double, in engineering, engineering, electrical engineering. And I brought him in to my company to work with. Um, I, when I started my second company, uh, I brought him in to do design work. And he was a young man who not, not only was bright enough to do what he could do, but he had a stick to himness. A stick to himness. Mm -hmm. They would get things done. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, now, um, I was able to deliver by just working and I, 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 doing whatever I need to do. Uh, I hired one young man uh, from Boston to come to Palo Alto. And uh, I designed what, told him what I had designed for him to do. He was a young man who uh, did a private flying and he was killed in an airplane crash. Mm in Sacramento, 
and I, and I, and I, had, I didn't have time to recruit Brenner, so I worked at night time designing the product that I was going him to do. And I not only uh, designed it, but I worked at the implementation of it. Yes. Uh, but I was doing what I needed to do to get the work done, the Euless packet needed. Now, um, David Packer went to the Pentagon as Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Defense. And the, an indication of the kind of confidence he had in me, or his respect, was that uh, he, he uh, designated, designated me to be uh, a reference. So I was interviewed, I became part of the vetting process for David Packard becoming Secretary of Defense. And he, when he went there, I didn't think about what would happen afterwards. I would not have anybody, another David Packard, <laughs> yes. to do the thing, to give me the kind of support that I needed to do the work that I had to do. Uh, that brought to Bill Hewlett, who, who was, had been president. He had become now CEO and chairman of the board. And I didn't have the rapport with Bill Hewlett that I had with David Packard. And for a while, I decided to leave a Hewlett Packard. Now, mm -hmm. I was just going to why I decided to leave. Uh, I was, um, I designed a product that we sold to Holiday Inn's Hotel uh, to do what was called point of sales uh, handling with computers at different, at various locations. And uh, what they told me at Holiday Inn's was that if they bought this product, it couldn't fail. I had to be spilled with And uh, I said, okay, so we tied together some computers operating in parallel and sent it to Holiday Inn in Little Rock, Arkansas. Those, they, they evaluated it and said they want to buy it. They made an offer for $40,000, which was a lot of money now and not, not later on. And uh, Bill Hewlett discovered that I had find, sold this product to Holiday Inn. He called me the next morning at 10 o'clock and said he had heard about what I sold to Holiday Inn. I said, yes. He said, well, I'm not going to permit you to ship it. We're not going to be in that business. So, and at present, he said, I want you to terminate that project today. At like 10 o'clock in the morning, and by two in the afternoon, I canceled, I not only canceled the order, but I terminated the project. And I'll fast forward, that product became Tandem Computers. Tandem? Tandem. T N D E M. Uh huh. That product became Tandem Computers. Tandem computers. Okay. Fast forward again. It was in 1969 that Bill Hewlett made me terminate the project in Canada. In 19, 2001, they bought it back through Compact Computer for $20 billion. $20 billion. <laughs> Wow. The same product. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And um, you received no credit for that? No. And no money? No. <laughs> no. no. I left HP. Well, I but. How could they have the power to do that? Well, because they bought it through. Uh, first off, when they canceled the, that product, uh -huh. they had nothing, nothing more to do with it. I, I mean, how could they uh, instruct you, tell you that you have to cancel it? It was your product. Well, yes, but I was doing it as an employee at Hewlett Packard Company. Oh. Oh. Even though you had left them? Well, yeah, I left them. I, I, I'm just explaining the reason why I left. And that I was see. one of the reasons I left, uh -huh. because they wouldn't permit me to build and, that product. And then you went back? No, I never oh. went back. <laughs> no. And uh, the, uh, then David Packard came back from the Pentagon mm -hmm. in uh, 
1972 and invited me to come back into HP. So this is the, the Reverend McKnight, this sounds like the uh, success story yeah. here that's yeah. coming into play. And then, uh, yes. now, he invited me back to HP. I, I, I invited me back to a meeting. And he said, the purpose of my meeting is that I want you to get Hewlett Packard Company out of the computer business. And my response was, well, if I got Hewlett Packard out of the computer business, what would I do? But my career is in computer development. And I said, so I can't come back. And uh, I'm five feet, five inches tall. Bill, D David Packard is six feet tall, five at that time. He got out of his chair and said, young man, you got the wrong attitude. He said, you, you brought us into this business. It is your responsibility to bring us out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm declaring that you are an irresponsible person for not doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you one yeah, thing for yeah. a moment. Yes. I see Dr. Cannon yes. want to interject something. Here. Well, I was thinking about, the, we're almost nearing the end of yeah. our segment, so yeah. I thought maybe you might want to help us as we move toward the yeah. conclusion, you, Reverend McKnight, as, as we move forward to that. Because I think the success story yeah. is tied into yeah. what he's saying, yeah. I believe. Well, yeah, and I think we must have him back yes. to complete the story. Yes. But what I now can do when I get on an elevator, I can now hold my head up a little higher. Okay. And no matter if I am the only African American in the city, when I get on that elevator, I know there's a black man in the elevator with me. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> that sounds and like every time yeah. I stop uh -huh. at a signal yeah. light, uh -huh. I, I can see your picture now uh -huh. in that signal light. Uh -huh. I, I can hardly wait for us to do a part two. We yes. cannot leave this story yes. unfinished because right. I want to hear about how you concluded your relationship with HP yes. and perhaps greater detail on uh, some of the things you accomplished while you were there. Yes. But let me just say, I want to thank you, Mr. Clay, for being here thank you, with us. Thank it's you, a pleasure. I don't know if I'm going to wash this hand for a while. <laughs> and Dr. Uh, Cannon, yes, thank, thank you, you so much, Mr. Clay. Clay. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I am, Robert McKnight, along with Dr. Barbara Cannon and our esteemed and distinguished guest, Mr. Clay, wishing you farewell and inviting you back for part two next time. Thank you for joining us. And you can read about Mr. Clay on the internet also. Roy L. Clay. Roy L. Clay. C-L-A-Y. that name. to education in our community. This show is about lifelong learning, teaching, and mentoring. Reverend Robert McKnight is our host today, and I'm a co-host with him. And our special guest is Mr. Roy L. Clay. And he was, going to, he was in the process of sharing with us on part one of this same show, the, uh, something about his career when he was working with Hewlett Packard, Packard 
and the evolution of his contribution to technology, I believe it was, and the computer. And we wanted to make sure that we heard the success story part of it, or the rest of the story. Uh, Reverend McKnight, would you introduce the, get us back on track again, please? Yes, you have taken us through, uh, Mr. Clay, uh, your early beginnings with uh, HP. And then you were sharing with us the reason why you parted company with them. If you could just briefly summarize that, and then, as Dr. Cannon said, move into the rest of the story for us. Well, to begin. The reason I left Hewlett Packard Company was that um, Bill Hewlett uh, and I did not agree on some important things. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing he disagreed with me on was that uh, a product that I had built and sold to Holiday Inn that he did not want as part of Hewlett Packard Company. Although, then go fast forward, in 2001, he bought that back. 2001, he bought it back, the product that he refused to have me bring into HP. He bought it back into HP for $20 billion, $20 billion with a B. <laughs> um, that, that was one thing. I'm going to go far, far beyond that. Uh, that was the beginning of Silicon Valley, as we know it. Mm. I see. Because in 1972, uh, when uh, I left HP, I was approached by a young man to uh, develop what Bill Hewlett had rejected, and that became Tandem Computers. That was the beginning of Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Bayer. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Perkins and I had worked together at Hewlett Packard Company, and he knew what, what I had done there. And we, he wanted me to be involved with the beginning of, of uh, the private sector, uh, which was Tandem Computers, and that was the beginning of Silicon Valley, the most successful IPO that they had done, anybody had done, and that was the beginning of Silicon Valley, and that was the beginning of Kind of purpose, coffin and buyer. But um, the day that I decided to leave HP was after I'd had a discussion with Bill Hewlett, and that time I had become general manager of the computer division of HP. There was no other computer activity, and uh, Bill came to my office and said, Bill Hewlett, said, you've done a very good job, and for that, um, I want to give you an increase, increase of salary, which he did, and he said, brother, I want to give you uh, an increased number of stock options, so I would own more of HP. And prior to then, David Packender had designated that I would be among the top 60 people in HP forever. But the last thing Bill Hewlett said, now, I also want to tell you that I want to name George Newman as general manager to replace you because I want someone to manage that division who knows nothing about computers. Well, mind you, I knew more than anybody at HP, but that was the reason he, why he didn't want me in that position. And when my mother had told me that if you were the best, you ought to be considered for that. And I, rem I remember when, uh, when the company at, at, uh, in Hula, at St. Louis they said they would not hire me because I was black. Um, I couldn't reconcile what Bill Hewlett had said, but he wanted to replace me as a top person by well, someone who knew nothing about computers. I went home that evening 
which I was earlier than normal, and I said to my wife, I talked to her. I told her about uh, Bill, my discussion with Bill Hewlett and what he had done. Her response immediately was, you know, then why are you going to stay at Hewlett Packard Company? Mm -hmm. And I give my, my resignation the next day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. um, so, uh, I talked, when I talked to young people about um, what we can do and should be doing, I also talked about people who have already done things. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, again, uh, George Washington Carver, Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. people who have done things in that, whereas I wanted to be a professional baseball player, I couldn't go with the St. Louis Cardinals because they didn't hire black, black look. But I remember that just do the things that you know how to do well, and the best of all alternatives is do things not only can you do well, but also that you like to do. Okay. Uh, and I follow um, my wife, wife's advice in leaving HP, as I've done some other things. Uh, and I talk to young people about things they should be doing in life. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do something well. Right? Um, I said to my, to my kids, learn how to do something well. Uh, they became engineers and, and scientists, but I didn't prod them to do that. They did it because they wanted to do things. These were your children? My children. Yeah. Oh, the daughter and her son? No, three sons. Three sons? Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, um, my company name is Rod L Electronics mm -hmm. that I started after, after an HP. And uh, my son's name is Rodney Lewis. So the Rod L is a Rodney Lewis. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I did that because when I was searching for a name, she said, why don't you name the company Rod L? It has a high tech sounding name. Mm -hmm. Rod L. Uh -huh. And uh, I wanted to work with you in whatever you do. Roy L. Electronics. Well, I was going to name it Roy L. Uh -huh. She said, no, name it Rod L. Rod L. <laughs> Rod L. Now, tell us something about the sticker I was reading about that carries uh, Rod L on it that's associated with the field of technology. Well, um, I also worked with IBM when they decided to develop the personal computer. And nobody knew that. In fact, uh, the chairman of, I, of IBM, Akers, did not want that publicized. In fact, he made that kept quiet. Uh, and I happened to know, find out about them by pure coincidence mm -hmm. by what they were doing. Whereas when I, when I designed the product that I had designed at Rod L, I called them because I thought they would need it. They said, yes, it's done, it's done right here in Boca Raton, Florida, and we want you to visit us. And um, uh, when I finished with them, with that des design and taking in, into the marketplace the personal computer, they did something that was quite unusual. On the, on the rear panel, of the hypothesis of what we build. They had the name, the rear panel of the computer, that the name Art Rod L was on the back of the, so to distinguish it from uh, uh, non, uh, uh, H, non IBM product, yes. it had to have Rod L on the back, on the rear panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, uh, they did that. They didn't have to ask me to do it. They just did that. Yes. But I was surprised when I found it that they, when they delivered the first person, personal computer that they built, they had Rod L on the back of it. Now, to, build, to get that computer into the marketplace, they had to make a test the last test they made on the product before they put it in the box to ship it was a test that was made by the product that, made, that I made. Which, now, the product is, was that um, 
you, underwriters laboratories required that after manufacturing was complete, a test which should be made to ensure that the product would be electrically safe from fire shock hazard. That is, it, the products that you have in your house, um, computer, microwave, environment, are designed to operate at 120 volts. However, when a power outage occurs, the voltage may turn back on at thousands to 1,500 volts. And if the user of that product happens to touch, touch it at that time, uh, and the product is not insured to withstand that voltage, that voltage surge, you could be shocked, you could be killed. Oh, I see. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, a few days ago, there was a state uh, publicized user of Apple computer that was electrocuted. Wow. Well, you use it. That was not more than three weeks ago. Oh, just recently? Yeah, yeah. very recently. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Apple, and they assured me that they, the person who was using the, the computer and electrocuted, was using a non, it was a non Apple uh, designated product. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is what we design uh, and use for uh, uh, IBM. This is used by every manufacturer of personal computers that were uh, Hewlett Packard Company, uh, Apple. Uh, Dell, Dell, all of them use that tester to ensure that a user of their computer would not be shocked. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the most dangerous product you have in your house, it is one that m most likely to in in cause that kind of damage, is your television set. Because I remember when you first saw a television set, you had to turn it on yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and wait. So power was brought to it. Uh, today, power is instant on. It's oh, always okay. there. Mm -hmm. So you could be shocked. And if you can't, if you had to touch your computer or your, your uh, uh, television set at a time, a power surge caused by power turning on here, right here in your area, right? which happened many, many times. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes cause it. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Right. Now, I have a personal question. You do not yeah. really have to respond, but mm -hmm. given uh, your history, the story that you have shared with us, do you have any regrets? Uh, as we hear the names of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and we never hear the name of Roy L. Clay. Well, uh, my wife, my late wife, brought the news, she used to bring newspaper clippings to me. And one, I don't know where it is now, but uh, I mentioned to Bill Hewlett that uh, he established a computer software facility. F, and he, his response to me was no, he would not do it. And that my suggesting it only implied that I was we're doing what he called empire building. So I want to build up something bigger. Empire building. And then um, the clipping that my wife had from the Chronicle newspaper was that Bill Gates was at Stanford at his forum, and he sat between Bill Hewlett and David Packard. And that product that Bill Hewlett said no to me, Bill Hewlett and Bill Gates, <laughs> and his net worth. Bill Gates' net worth was greater than Bill Hewlett and David Packard combined. And I often said, what did they, so what did they think about? What, what were they thinking about after that? Mm -hmm. uh, um, that and, and, and what I want uh, our young people to know is what can happen if you learn to do something well and you pursue it. Mm -hmm. So that um, 
We don't know what Trevor Martin would have been had he gone through. Yes, yes. Uh, but I had come through uh, an era, a time, and when I studied by candlelight and no window appointment, and time came to be a founder of Hewlett Packard Company mm -hmm. in a yes. Silicon Valley. Just, and, I, you know, and they, they should know that. I don't, I, don't, I don't want them to praise me for what I've done. Yeah. But you think, this is what we can learn to do. Mm -hmm. That is what all of us can do. Yeah. Right? You, you, just as we can play baseball well, mm -hmm. or we can, you know, good entertainers. Yes. Uh, we can uh, also can make contributions to any other area. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That we pursue. Yeah. Right. Um, I thought, and just yesterday, it have dragged along. I thought about um, there's a movie uh, with Sammy Davis Jr. called Mr. Bojangles. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. uh, right. Never the greatest dancer tap ever. Right? Yeah. And I was so pleased with seeing that, mm -hmm. with the talent that he had. Yes. He was only able to get into entertainment. He could have done many other things. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, just as uh, football players and, and basketball players and baseball players. Tennis players, yes. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they can do things well. Mm -hmm. right? And we, not, we should not be distracted mm. by other things that maybe we like, but we can't do as well. Yes. It was yeah. some other things. Mm -hmm. right? Now, let me ask you, if you had it to do all over again, what would you do different? Nothing. <laughs> 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 I would follow what my parents told me, that learn how to do something well. And there's no greater fate than to be successful at something you know how to do well and that mm -hmm. you like to do. Mm -hmm. right? And you don't necessarily know what that's all going to be in the end. Mm -hmm. And as I say, uh, I just turned 84 last week, uh, and uh, I'm trying to determine what I want to do when I build, when I grow up. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. So yeah. when, when you were that. when you were working on the computer and all of that, what was what did you like about that? Well, I liked what I liked about it was that it was pure logic, what caused these things to happen was our thinking things through yes. what we wanted in the end, mm -hmm. something to be, mm -hmm. and in the beginning, how do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. And everything that you see that Apple's done, and, uh, uh, Google and everybody else, is through pure logic, thinking about how something can happen. And as you were talking, I'm thinking about Thomas Edison and the light bulb yeah, yes. and his persistence. Yeah. He, he, he enjoyed what he was doing yes. and he stayed with it. Right. He never gave up. Right. right. And, uh, and uh, the radio, the radio was designed in Palo Alto. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, every uh, person who's done great things has conceived them. What, all, what he or she wants to do mm -hmm. and how to make it happen. That's right. And who are you doing it for? Yeah. Why are you doing it? I think of George Washington Carver also yeah, because yeah. he was persistent yeah. and he had, he was the flowers of uh, plants making them yeah. grow yeah. and he was just focused, yeah. very focused and yeah. enjoyed what he was doing. At, had a passion. Yeah, at a time when education was segregated. Mm -hmm. We had just come out of being illegally ed educated right? for someone to gain the knowledge that he gained right? with, I don't know, persistence had to be part of it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and and the other part is intellect. Yeah. The yeah. capacity is yeah. there. Yeah. So it's about seeing and believing and doing. Yeah. And it's that thing that nothing would hold you back if you yeah. were able to go ahead and do it. Yeah. And somehow it gets done. And it's nice when it's done easily. Right. But I'm thinking you had obstruction, a little bit of obstruction well, that came along. Um, yeah, there were obstructions and had to do with race, many of them. Yes. But that 
told you earlier, my wife, my mother said, never let racism be the reason you don't succeed. Never yeah. let racism yeah. be the reason you, you don't, don't succeed. succeed. Yes. That probably needs to be a quote. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. And again, yeah. Now, if you had to uh, choose someone, to name someone that influenced you outside uh, of your mother, uh, if you had a mentor, role model, who would that be uh, growing up? Yeah, um, was uh, the uh, Paul, Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, yeah. Paul Robeson, yeah. Because he, yeah, he could do many things. Yeah. Well. A football player. Yes. And he got spiked in his yeah, leg, yeah, I believe, several yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. He didn't right. let that stop him? No, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. My role model overall was Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that in 1951, that St. Louis University, when I would ask, it, in, a, in a sociology class where we asked who our role model was, mm -hmm. and I mentioned Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it was quiet. Hush. Quiet, uh, quiet huh? in quiet. the room. Uh -huh. Because I didn't know as much then as I knew later about Paul, Paul, why he was just liked and why he lead, had to leave the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my role model was someone who was just disrespected mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and George Washington Carver was brought to Congress to speak, yeah. and when he was there, they. Uh, went ahead and they were so late yeah. that they went into the end part of the day yeah. and then they were only giving him 15 minutes to speak yeah. but he wound up they were there for about two more hours yeah. because what he had to say yeah. was so powerful uh marion anderson right she could not perform yes uh, in in uh in the, the the hall i believe the daughters in of, new york yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but she sang at the lincoln memorial yeah, yeah right. concert Right. Yes. Right. Now, as you reflect back upon your life and many of the obstacles and impediments that were placed in your path, where did you find the strength and the resiliency to keep going? People tried to press you down and keep you down. Well, the support that I, that I got from my family, the neighborhood where I was reared, and the support that I got from my wife after my mother. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do anything out that I didn't consult my wife, anything of a major uh, consequence that I did without consulting my wife. Uh, she knew about my past, I was in childhood, and uh, and my not being hired by uh, McDonald's to begin with. Uh, and what I did when I went to HP, um, she uh, was satisfied with my working literally 13 hours a day mm -hmm. at HP because I had to get it done. Mm -hmm. Uh, then one, one day, uh, and then she, of course, when I had a conversation with Bill Hewlett and he told me what he wanted to do, and she recommended that I leave. Uh, material possessions were secondary. Uh, she wanted me to make sure that I liked was ha what I did because I was more likely to be successful yeah. in doing what I liked to do. And then one day, I, I began to play golf, and what my wife accepted about it was my, my I would take my kids up with me, yeah. boys, and uh, they, they let them caddy for me. But I was asked to join the Olympic Club in San Francisco. Mm. Uh, as the first, I didn't know that they had no African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I asked them, they asked me to join. I told them I'd think about it. And on the way home, I tell, I tell my wife, and she would give me many reasons why I, why I shouldn't, because of what it costs. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 
without hesitation, she said, join. Uh -huh. Oh, she did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and I was able to become a founder of a foundation at the Olympic Club called the Olympic Club Foundation, the purpose of which is to raise funds to support underprivileged kids in the nine county area. Out of the Olympic Club. Out of the Olympic Club. And to this point, we've, gen we've uh, generated over $20 million. Really? That, wow. that, that I made at a point to make designate funds to nine county underprivileged areas. So money comes to Oakland, we have some in East Palo Alto, and wherever we designate it to be. So, um, giving whatever assistance I can um, to make our people successful, um, that's what I will do. And I, mm -hmm. I still have time to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, as we conclude, uh, just give me the number of years. You speak so fondly of your wife. How many years were you married? Uh, I was married for 38 years. 38 yeah. years. Once again, Mr. Clay, I want to thank you yeah. for joining us yeah. on the show. I want to thank my co-host, yeah. Dr. Barbara Cannon. Yeah. And I want to share with you, uh, at the conclusion of this program, Google the name Roy L. Clay and find out who's in that computer that you are now working on. Thank you so much for being a part of education in our community. Until next time, this is Reverend Robert McKnight saying so long. And thank you kindly. Thank you so much.